You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers, about hikers, for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi, and as always, thanks so much for joining me on Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, sponsored by absolutely nobody, yet. I'm talking to one or two companies, but nothing to report so far. As I said last week, let me know if you have any good ideas. This week, we have one of the more well-known hikers in America, Jennifer Farr Davis. Jennifer is hugely experienced, gives back to the trail, and frankly, a dream to interview. I was kind of a bystander as she expounded upon everything to do with hiking. Jennifer will be along shortly. We also have three more interviews from the Outdoor Retailers Summer Market in Denver with knives, mugs and socks to talk about today. I'm not adding in another section this week because I'm trying to get the show back down to just over an hour. The last few shows have been about an hour and a half and to be honest, it's a bit too much for me to put together on a Wednesday. An hour seems much more manageable. Of course, we'll have another slice of The Year We Seize the Day by Elizabeth Best and Colin Bowles. This week, we're up to the first part of day 12, and Colin is back to his bleeping self. Just the once this time, though. So, let's meet Jennifer Farr Davis. Right, now, some of you may remember way back in, I think, episode number 25 or 26, I introduced Hiking Royalty, Miss Janet. And we've got another version of Hiking Royalty today, Jennifer Farr Davis. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? Good. How are you? How would you like being named in the same breath as a Miss Janet? Oh, yeah, I don't think I've earned that. She's pretty great. <laughs> She's something. Now, Jennifer, uh, I was looking through, because Jennifer's actually got a wiki page. She's also, I think, the first guest we've ever had who's got a Wikipedia page. She was a National Geographic Adventure of the Year, and you've done, according to that, 14,000 miles of trails on six different continents. Which continents have you hiked on then? Well, Is that all of them? Uh, yeah, I haven't been to Antarctica, and I don't like cold weather. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't right. Yeah, right. But you've been everywhere, everywhere else then. How about that? A lot. Yep, a lot of places. And whether you like it or not, and I suspect you do like it, but you've been an inspiration to many people on the trail. In fact, especially women. And several of my guests on this show have actually credited your run on the trail as their reason for doing it. Does this feel like a burden for you, or do you welcome that, that attention, the expectation of being a role model, particularly a role model for women, as more and more women are going on the trail? Well, I think there's, you know, a lot of female um, hikers out there who can be role models, and I'm certainly glad that my, you know, story has had an impact that's encouraged other people to get outside. And you know, part of my wanting to write books and and share my stories is when I started backpacking, I found so much resistance culturally and also so few resources for young women, particularly who wanted um, to hike alone. So I think getting that story out there um, is important. And there's a, a lot of women who can do it. But I, I'm certainly glad that the message is getting across that young women are able and capable and welcome on long distance trails. Yeah. So what was that resistance? How did that manifest itself then in terms of women hiking alone? Well, I grew up in the Southeast and I I think there were a lot of cultural barriers. I mean, here, most outdoors folks and my, my dad was a big outdoorsman and my granddad, but it was mostly hunting and fishing. And the idea of women going alone um, raised a lot of safety concerns for friends and relatives and my family. Um, And then I think, you know, misconceptions about um, the risk of the outdoors, whether it be bears or snakes or storms or whatnot, um, that, that was thrown in there too. But I think, I think more than anything, it was, it was the idea of, you know, a woman hiking by herself and and running into people um, who perhaps would be unsavory on the trail. That was, that was the biggest um, concern. I think we're all unsavory on the trail, but that's a different meaning of the word unsavory. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Have you ever felt in, in any imminent danger through, from people on the trail? 
Um, you know, there's, there's been maybe, you know, two to three in my years of hiking that made me feel uneasy. Um, it never caused an encounter, but it made me certainly want to create space and get away. And then I did have a very difficult experience on my first through hike on the Appalachian trail where I actually encountered, um, someone who had committed suicide on the trail. And I was not in risk at that point, but I didn't know it. Um, It certainly felt like I was at risk. I didn't know if it was a suicide. I didn't know what had happened. So that was very difficult. And through that, um, you know, I experienced the the healing properties of, of hiking and being in nature and the incredible support of the trail community. So I don't go out there and say, oh, it's safe and you're fine and nothing will ever happen and everyone should go hike. I say there are risks and you should learn about them and you should learn how to be smart on the trail. But let's also put it in perspective and say, your risks are lower than driving 70 miles per hour. Your risks are lower than going to a frat party on a college campus. Like, (laughs) you know, I I mean, I don't think the risk on the Appalachian trail or any long trail is high, but they are out there. And so the more informed and knowledgeable you are, the safer you're going to be. Yeah. It's like the the information you give your kids always exercise caution. That's what the, you know, really you should be exercising caution. Yeah. And, and, we, and, and I'm particularly obviously interested in you as a woman on the trail. And so and I know you've only ever been a woman. So from your observations, can you articulate what you believe to be the main differences between a man's hike and a woman's hike? Or do you think they're pretty much the same these days? You know, I, I think there's two ways to look at it. I do not think the trail discriminates based on gender. And if anything, I think, and I don't have the stats, but from my observations, I feel like women have a higher success rate or completion rate on these Definitely. through hikes than the men. Um, so I think women physically and emotionally are extremely well suited um, for long distance backpacking. But then you also have, um, you know, the community aspect. And I think sometimes there can be discrimination or, or sexism against women. A lot of people, um, and I, you know, I, I come across as I'm very tall and, and muscular. So people don't necessarily doubt my abilities when I'm out there, but I've seen people doubt the abilities of women, I think based mostly yes. off of gender. And then, um, you know, I, I think the main bias out there has actually been um, a benefit for me. <laughs> um, I think there's there's a lot of, I just felt like I had a lot of dads basically looking out for me. On the <laughs> and, and, you know, they were extra protective of me because I was a young woman, but um, I didn't, I didn't mind it. They weren't telling me what to do. They were just very, you know, kind older gentlemen who were looking out for me. And I think we had a strong bond, just like, like a father and a daughter. And I don't know that we would have had the same relationship if I was, you know, a young guy out there. But I think, um, yeah, I I think overall the community also does a pretty good job um, with female hikers, but there's always, there's always work to be done. I think it's on the trail, there's, there's the community and um, the community is harder for minorities. I think it's much harder to be a minority and hike through rural areas with Confederate flags than it is to be a woman necessarily. That's interesting. <laughs> we did cover that in one episode and that didn't go at all well <laughs> uh, with people on Facebook, but it is one of those things, I guess. Well, yeah, I have a, gu- you know, I have a guiding company in Western North um, Carolina and, um, yeah, I just see people, I, I get firsthand experience and feedback about people who don't feel safe hiking in certain areas because not necessarily the trail or the bears or the snakes, but the way the community near the trail presents itself. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong or accurate, but it is a fact that it makes people feel uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah, and people's perception is their reality. So that's really all that matters, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... My observation, just just, for, and I've thought about this a lot about the difference between a man's hike and a woman's hike, or or actually the results of it. I think men are, 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 and you're right. I think most of the women who start the hike, certainly the ones I, I started the hike with, finished, and a lot of the men who started the hike didn't finish. And I think it's because men take more risks than women. Women are much more steady, and they get you know they get the work done. They're they're, up, they're less showy than men. And they just keep on going till they get to the end. I, I literally, I think it was 75, 25% split of men, women when I started and 50, 50 when I finished. It was quite remarkable to me how the women came through. 
Yeah. Yeah. Women are very consistent. And I think a lot of the women who get to the trail have already overcome more barriers to make it there than a lot of the guys who arrive at the beginning. Yes, definitely. Their personalities may be better cut out for, you know, what's required of a through hike, but yeah, yeah, no women. Yeah. Physically and emotionally. And the fact that we've evolved as sort of these long-term caregivers and we're really good at sort of (laughs) dull nagging chronic pains and just doing work day after day after day. And, um, the the trail is a good place for us. Yeah. And and several of your hikes have been attempts, uh, attempts to set records, So apart from the record itself, which must give you tons of satisfaction, I'm sure, do you find time when you're doing these record-setting heights to actually experience the beauty of the trail around you and the people around you? Because you're moving so fast, I suspect you don't strike up too many relationships while you're moving along the trail, do you? Um, I I do strike up lots of conversations. Most of them are brief. Um, I will say, based off you know, judgments and stereotypes. No one knew I was going for a record. Oh, really? (laughs) Going for a record. I mean, no woman had ever done it. No one knew who I was. And so no one thought, oh, wow, this woman, she's trying to set a record. I just look like a day hiker. Um, And I never (laughs) ran. I I just hiked. So honestly, most of the through hikers, the way that- Oh, hang on, hang on. I must interrupt you. You never ran? I never ran. No. Oh, God, you don't have 50 miles a day just walking? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> you must walk incredibly fast then. No, I mean, it was more just consistency. I started at five in the morning and hiked till 10 or 11 o'clock at night and oh, took wow. very few breaks. So it was three miles per hour, um, excluding wow. Maine and New Hampshire and doing it all day long. Um, wow. So, yes, yes, I missed out on the community. And I, you know, I always want to say, like, there are things you miss out on doing a record that you get in a traditional through hike, but there are things you also learn, experience, gain, and a record that you don't get in a traditional through hike. You can say the same about section hiking. You can say the same about day hiking. And I really think you just need to look at them all as different animals and realize they all have their benefits and they all have their things that, um, are going to be disadvantages. And so the record I totally absorbed and enjoyed and appreciated and needed the beauty of the trail even more because it served as an inspiration when I was so empty constantly. I was always like, why am I out here? Why am I doing this? (laughs) Because I love it and it's beautiful. And I want to get to that mountain that I've hiked past before. And I want to see that view and I want to make it to that waterfall because it is so amazing and such a gift to be out yeah. here. So yeah, the record, you know, it, it's something I am proud of. It's also something I've, I've struggled to um, distance myself from. And the fact that, you know, most of my hiking has not been for records and I've done a no. ton of family hiking and slow hiking. And no matter how out of shape I am, I'm always still identified <laughs> with the record. So <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm sure, and you're always going to be as well. And for any many ways, that's how you should be as well. I think I think so because it's such an extraordinary feat that you did. But when you do hike at this at the normal human being's pace, or or maybe even when you're hiking, not going for a record, do you still hike pretty fast and, and for long days, or do you t- do you do 15 and 20 mile days as opposed to 40 and 50 mile days? All of the above. I mean, I definitely had an interest in pushing my limits. And um, if I'm out there by myself, yeah, occasionally I just, I like to hike all day. My favorite times on trail are early morning and late evening. So I like being out there at those times. But I also, you know, I'll, I'll pack in a book and sometimes stop at two and occasionally hike with groups or my husband or, you know, backpack with mm-hmm. kids, which is a whole different animal. So I I like it all. I mean, I think, you know, the trail's a great place to kick back and relax, and it's also a great place to test your limits. Yeah. Well, when we were talking about doing this, I, I did ask you about the the Mountains to Sea trail that you did with your husband, Brew, and your two children, Charlie and Gus. And and I know the answer to this. I, and my question was at the time, how did the family function as a unit? I thought you were, you'd be this slick running unit the whole time, but... Apparently not. It didn't work out as a unit as well as you you might have thought, did it? No. And, um, you know, I do want to say as far as the trail itself, the Mount to Sea Trail was amazing. And the organization that runs it is incredible. And I highly recommend it as an adventure. But for our family... 
the way we planned it where I was going to hike and then also advocate for the trail. And my family was doing little pieces with me and we were together every night. It was too much for our family. And I think, you know, in all these experiences, whether it's a section hike, a through hike, a record, a family adventure, part of the learning process is trial and error. And I hate it when people, you know, get off or stop early and just see it as a failure because part of finding the right adventures is being able and willing to take risk. And so, you know, we signed up for for more than we bargained for with the Mounts to Sea Trail. And there are always, you know, extenuating circumstances. And for us, you know, my husband didn't have great health in the fall and my son, we didn't quite realize as a, you know, one-year-old how reckless and rambunctious and senseless <laughs> it's going to be. Um, but, it, you know, it's okay to, to do something or stop early and say, that's too much for me or us right now, and we need to reassess. And that's all part of the process. So, yeah, I don't, you know, not every adventure is well-suited for who you are and where you are in life. And that that's just part of adventuring. Yeah, I'm sure as your family get older, it's going to be easier, obviously, with them to, to hike with them as well. But in terms of if you had to pick a hike you wanted to do, would you prefer to do it with your family or would you prefer to do it alone? Do you like those times alone on the trail? Yeah, I love, I mean, I love both. Um, my husband and I, we give each other two weeks a year for independent um adventures and travel. And so I do backpack two weeks a year on my own. And and I imagine that will hopefully increase a little as my kids get older, or that will add, you know, an additional week or two for, for family adventures, or maybe my husband and I will go off and do something on our own. But I think it's, you know, it's all good. It's like, it's like the record versus a traditional through hike versus a section hike, like there's pros and cons. And I, I really, you know, for me, as someone who loves the trails and loves the outdoors, I think, well, why would I want to limit myself? Like, I want to do this my whole life. And the more options, the more variety, the different trails, the different styles, the better. So I want to be a diverse hiker, um, for sure. Yeah. Now, you did say earlier on, nobody knew you were trying to break the record when you did it. So what brought about the desire to do that, or even the inkling that you were able to break that record? And did you tell people you were going to be doing it? Or how did you go about it? Or did you, or did you just sort of see it coming as a possibility and then just carry on with it? So, yeah, I, yeah, I set a couple of records. And, um, and even leading up to, you know, the overall AT record, which I'm most Uh. known for, but part of it was this interest in endurance and, and testing my limits and finding out what I could do. And then part of it was, was circumstantial. And, and there's so many hikers who do a long trail and get addicted and they do another and they do another. And then, you know, one of two things happen, they fall into that routine of just working to hike Or life starts to take over and they have to, you know, adjust their adventures. So for me, I started a a hiking company. I got married. I had less time, still wanted to do the trails. And instead of choosing shorter trails, I chose to do the long ones um, in a shorter time. Right. Yeah. That makes sense, actually. I think about it. Yeah, cool. So you've got less less time to take away from your family. So do it quickly. (laughs) Yeah. So my husband actually, um, he helped me in 2008 and I wanted to set a women's record on the Appalachian Trail. And so we did it and I got to the end and I was really frustrated with myself by the, by the finish because I realized I had limited myself from the beginning by placing myself in a separate category from the men who had set the record. And I realized by the time I got to the last mountain that I could have done it in a shorter time. And I no longer believe that there needed to be a gender gap in the records on long distance trails. So that, that really personal belief and query and interest in what my best was combined with the fact that three years later, you know, my husband and I were family planning and talking about having kids. And I was just kind of like, holy crap. Okay. Like this is really going to throw a wrench in things. And you think, (laughs) yeah. And before giving not just my time, but my body over to being a mom, which has been, you know, so phenomenal and also so incredibly challenging. It was really important for me at that phase in life to know what my body could do, um, 
beforehand. So, and apart from that and on the trail. So my husband agreed to help me one more time and that was 2011. And that's when we set the overall record on the AT. That's interesting. So you you did it to see what your body could do before children. And did you notice, this is going to Women will probably be laughing at me now because I just don't know the answer to this. So did you notice a significant difference in your body's abilities after you had the baby? Obviously not straight after, but say say a year after you had uh, Charlie, was, was your daughter, I believe. Um, did, you, did you notice a big difference in your body or did it just get back to normal within a, uh, within a year or so? Well, I mean... Yeah. Childbearing is just, it's a long season. I mean, I was, you know, we were trying to conceive and then pregnant for nine months. And then I nursed both my kids for a year and and physically I did bounce back, but you're looking at like a two year cycle, you know? So it was like, okay, there was two years. And I, again, you know, I backpacked, um, when I was pregnant with my daughter, my first child, we backpacked 500 miles um, during my <laughs> second trimester. So, yeah, you think the record was tough. <laughs> <laughs> I would think, yeah. Um, that was, it was really challenging and also really good because hormonally pregnancy was very difficult for me and I struggled with some depression and hiking was certainly the best tool or skill I had to combat that. And my doctor was wonderful and extremely communicative and supportive. So, um, yeah, we made it through that. And now after having my children, I do feel like my body is there. And if I wanted physically to do the things that I was doing before children, I think I could accept that, you know, psychologically, I'm not in the same place and of course not no I, that, that, that's int- you know it's so interesting to me how how you talked about the physical changes of course men don't have to think about that sort of thing but i i, I was wondering if you if you hadn't broken the record the 40 if, if you hadn't done the 46 days would that still be something you'd like to do now i don't know um I don't like when I did it in 2011, a huge part of my mentality was, this is it. This is my one shot. I'm not coming back. And, and there was a time, um, I went southbound. So there was a time in Vermont, I had fully accepted that I was not able to set the record and I no longer Uh thought it was, um, on the table, but because it was my one shot, I decided to keep going so that I could find my best because really that's what I wanted is I wanted my answer. So yeah, I don't think, I don't think I would still want to go. I think I would have been okay failing that summer and and still putting, you know, a period at the end of that sentence. Um, I certainly feel like I'm in a different season of life now in a different pace of life. Isn't that interesting? That that would normally spawn a lot more questions, but I've got lot, lot other questions I want to ask anyway. But uh, um, now you've you've turned and you've mentioned it before, and I'm going to let's talk about the Blue Ridge Hiking Company in a second. But you turned your hiking life into a business. Is it now your job, or are you simply leveraging a passion? Or you know, are you still enjoying hiking, or is it just different now? I feel like yeah, I'm not answering your questions very well today because everyone I just say both but it's, it's both. <laughs> um, it, is, it is very much a job and I joke that at least with the hiking company you know we have um, I have a great team we have awesome guides we have office help and I say what I do now is mostly the not fun part like I do the permits and insurance and risk management and fees and if an incident yeah. comes up on trail or you know within the team then I step in but um, I'm so I love at the end of the year um, and anytime I get together with the guides or when I do go out on the trip I'm just reminded of how valuable it is to help people get outdoors. And most of the people we work with don't have a background or experience um, with the outdoors in any way. A lot of them are coming from cities or backgrounds where the outdoor was was not part of their upbringing. Several people come to us who want to, you know, learn how to through hike the Appalachian Trail from from through hikers and on the Appalachian Trail. And so we can take them backpacking out there and teach them and show them. And so Yeah, I think it's, I'm so passionate about what it can do. And for me, you know, I, um, I don't know what these people need, but I know that 
all hikers say the trail gives you what you need. And so I'm like, man, if we can help facilitate and get people outdoors, what a great way to spend your days. Um, well, I'll tell you what, you preempted my question then, because I looked at your, um, you know, the Blue Ridge Hiking Company website, and it says, I said, it might have been on your wiki page, I'm not sure. It says the trail is there for everyone at every phase in life. And I know that you take out these small groups of people, many of whom have probably never hiked. Is the trail actually for everybody? Or, the, or are some people simply not suited to the outdoors? Or do they find that they, once they get out there, they find what they need when they're out there? Uh, I I do honestly believe it, it is for everyone. And, you know, there are physical limitations. Um, of course. But I, but I think a lot of times they're also blown out of proportion. Um, one thing, you know, I've been happy with with our hiking company is, is when people do have a, a health concern or mobility issue, we always try to adapt and find ways to get them outdoors. And so this year is our 10-year anniversary. And what we did to celebrate is we offered 10 hikes to families or individuals with special concerns. And so it's been um, kids with Down syndromes, families of multiple. Oh, wow. um, I'm going to backpack next month with a, a dad and a daughter who they're like my heroes. It's it's Chris Kane and Calissa Kane, which you might want to look them up. But she has um, CP cerebral palsy and is in a wheelchair. And her dad has hiked with her all over the country. And we're going to go wow. um, spend a night and camp on the Appalachian Trail together. So yeah, I am a big believer that... Um, you know, I wouldn't say that a through hike is there for everyone, but the trail itself, the outdoors, um, yeah, that'll meet you where you're at. And we have people who occasionally say, you know, we just want to go picnic or sit on a rock or my wife's going on chemo, mm -hmm. going through chemo, but she wants to see a sunset. Can you help us? And yeah, that's totally our mission is, is to help people, you know, experience the trail on their own terms. That is awesome. That wasn't that wasn't the answer I was expecting, but that's a really good, really good. I'm really really pleased that's the case. That somebody, you know, I'd I'd hope everybody would get something out of it, but I just kind of wonder whether people are so town bound that you know if they like the idea of getting out there, but you know when they get out there, they think, oh my god, this is not for me at all. You know, have you had any bad anybody had any bad experiences out there where they just couldn't cope with it? Yeah. I'm sure it, physically it must be tough. Yeah, I mean, and and it is hard. And when you take people out and it's so far out of their comfort zone and they've never peed in the woods and then they go on a backpacking trip, like, yeah. you know, that's a big deal. And unlike other, um, organizations or, or guiding services, we're not out there to really push people. Um, we want to give them the option to say, you know, at some point, if they're in the middle of the woods, we have to say, okay, you have to get to a, at least a road crossing or an access point. <laughs> but like, you should feel so, like sometimes, you know, um, on rare occasions, people have signed up, signed up for a, a backpacking trip and then get out there and after the first few miles or after the first night, they say, I don't, you know, I don't think I can make it or I don't want to make it. And we say, well, isn't it incredible that you got this far? Um, and and yes. you need to make the decision because the last thing we want to do, you know, is set up any type of, you know, death march out there or, or forced <laughs> experience. And, you know, yeah. quite frankly, you see it with kids too. Like when it's their decision and when they're setting the pace, they're going to love it. They're going to want to come back. When you're making them do what you wanted to do or what you thought they could do, it's pretty much miserable. So it's, it's the same approach with the hiking company. Let's celebrate what we can do and, you know, let people who most of them are grown adults make their own decisions. Now, I, I looked at your books and do you enjoy, firstly, do you enjoy write, the process of writing? I love it. Yeah. You do. Okay. Now, you've got the new one, which is uh, Pursuit of Endurance, and it says, Harnessing the Record-Breaking Power of Strength and Resilience. And it says in the notes somewhere, I found, empowers readers to unlock the phenomenal endurance and leverage, and leverage newfound grip to achieve personal best in everything from sports, family, to the boardroom. <laughs> What's the Cliff Notes version of that? I mean, how... You you giving them techniques to to how you got your mindset right for for the, for getting endurance. Well, the reason I wanted to write the book is because um, you know I haven't done anything close to the AT record in seven years. Um, I haven't done you know a, a hike over two weeks in over seven years. But the lessons of the trail are so interwoven and so integral into my everyday life and my parenting and my business skills, um, and supporting other 
you know, loved ones and friends. So for a lot of people who are not hikers reading this book, um, I think is going to give them insight to the trail and to different record setters who I interviewed, and they're going to enjoy the adventure stories and then take, you know, some of those trail lessons away and apply them to their everyday life. Because hikers definitely have a certain mentality. Um, But for, you know, I think for people who have been on the trail and love the trail, a lot of them sometimes struggle to transition into quote unquote, the real world, if you want to call it that. But I think this is a really empowering book for hikers to say, look how much you've learned from the trail. Look how it can help or apply to like any facet of life. And I think a lot of times as hikers, we do feel like we're oddballs or we don't quite fit in, but we have this amazing education um, from the trail. And we have this amazing set of skills when it comes to perseverance and communication and having the right mindset and being positive and looking ahead and budgeting and all these things we do to complete the trail. And like, those are real life skills. I could not agree with you more because when I was out there, when I was about five or 600 miles into the trip, maybe a bit longer than that, I was talking to people at night, you know, these, a lot of these youngsters who are out there were there because they didn't really know what they wanted to do in life. I said, you should make this the, the main thing on your resume. Because if I now I've seen what the trail is like and how difficult it can be, I'd be so impressed with somebody who's had the fortitude and the resilience to keep going on a trail, to do 2,000 miles on a trail. If I saw that on some of resume, that is somebody I would want to hire. You know, they, may, they may not think they can do things, but as you say, there are so many aspects of life you bring to bear to get through that trail, aren't there? Absolutely. And and that was my experience. My first job after the Appalachian Trail, I got hired immediately because of my through hike. And then after like my third long distance trail, I became an entrepreneur because no one would hire me. (laughs) (laughs) Every 10 months, there was a through hike on my resume. Yeah, Yeah, there might be a reason for that. Yeah. Um, and I see that recently, you, I know you were on the board of the ATC, but you've come off. Is this because you've been spreading yourself a little bit too thinly and doing so many things? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's one of my faults in life is I'm just, I'm really driven and I love it all and I want to do it all. And I love work and I love my kids and I love the trails and I always want to give back. And um, yeah, I, I was really honored to be a part of the um, Appalachian Trail Conservancy board and yeah. worked really hard at it and realized I just didn't have what it took to give my job what it needed, give my family what they needed and give the volunteer position what it needed. Um, so, you know, if but you're I, a big proponent though, aren't you? You're uh, still a big yeah, proponent of you know, what yeah. the ATC do. Right. And I hated, you know, I hated taking any of that away, but I'm not going to sacrifice my family. And then my job is, you know, super important to provide for my family. And it's also my passion. And so, yeah, I had to say goodbye to the board temporarily, but I was, I will say like my biggest hesitation and working with the ATC was that I love the trail so much. And I thought, man, if I get on the backside and see all the politics and how the organization (laughs) runs, it's, you know, it might affect my impression of the trail And what happened was I just fell more in love. Like those people work so hard and they want everyone to have access to a trail that is a really beautiful, meaningful, special place. And they're protecting it from such large impacts and small impacts. And like, I just, yeah, I have nothing but positive things to say about the ATC and everyone should get involved in some form or fashion, whether it's um, making a donation or doing trail maintenance or other volunteer projects. Sure. Now, Talking about politics, I don't want to drag you into a political question, so you can pass if you want to, but recently, I don't know if you've heard about the Crawfords, this family of eight, who hiked with their six kids. Because of the rules in Baxter State Park, they're not allowed to take their two-year-old son, Rainier, above tree line uh, at Katahdin. So the family ended, they took the decision as a family to end their hike at tree line and not go to the sign, which would have driven me personally crazy. Do you think there's certain rules certainly in that situation, should be modified to allow for such an epic adventure to allow them to finish as a family at the top of the mountain? Well, you know, Baxter is a funny animal. And I went up eight months pregnant, um, by the way. Interesting, yes. Uh, So you had a viable child inside you, which you took up there. Um, And and Baxter's always been very heavily regulated. Um, And I know, you know, one of my friends and a man I interviewed for – 
the pursuit of endurance, Warren Doyle, he has hiked it even in a sign of civil disobedience. Um, when they used to close the mountain just for, for, you know, bad weather or rain or fog. Um, and he actually spent a night in jail because he was caught hiking it and wrote a poem about how regulated the mountain was. And so, you know, I think within this idea of wilderness, you have to be able to assume risk. And um, it's really great when that's a personal decision. And, you know, I always hesitate to say that, um, at any point, you should disregard land management regulations because most of them are so good and they're there to keep people safe and they're there to protect the trails. But I also think our society and public lands are becoming overly regulated. So, you know, a yes. two year old, you don't really want to turn a two year old into an activist. But I, cer I certainly <laughs> think there are, are times and individuals and places where, um, you know, a civil discourse or civil disobedience about what the meaning of wilderness really truly is, is going to be important to protect it. Yeah. I, you know, I think that was a really good answer, another really good answer because I, I, I was conflicted about it. I think it was a wonderful decision by the family to decide to finish the trail together. I really, really felt for them. But, you know, the thought that they couldn't go and touch the sign, but all of the family had a, had a say in that decision and they decided to finish at the tree line. So I thought it was tremendous. Yeah. And last couple of questions. Do you have any immediate or even long-term hiking ambitions left? Um, so I mentioned the two weeks a year that that's the gift yeah. my husband and yeah. I give each other. So this year is the Pinhoti trail. Um, I did the Alabama half. I'll do the Georgia half later this fall. And I just want to say it is an incredible trail. Like it is just Appalachian trail light. The mountains are beautiful. There's less people. It's more temperate, especially during the early spring and late fall. Like it's a trail that a lot of people who go to the AT for the AT experience, they'd actually be much better suited to go to the Pinhoti trail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really um, interesting <laughs> yeah i mean all the spring breakers who go to the appalachian trail and you know there they are with all the through hiking numbers and it's cold and the mountains are you know steeper just go to alabama it's warmer there's more flowers there's less people and the climbs aren't as steep like it is lovely um so I've been a big fan of that trail. And then, um, yeah, long term, there's a ton I want to do. I'm, I'm about a third of the way through a section hike of the CDT. But um, are, you enjoy, are you enjoying that, by the way? Well, it's funny. I was. I was loving it. And then I had my daughter and um, spent some time out there. Two different years went out to section hike. And I would just ball my eyes out because my <laughs> I miss my baby and I was in the middle of the Wind River range and I felt so um detached and so I thought you know what I am hiking this trail right now to check it off and be a triple crowner and that's the worst possible reason to finish a trail and yes. so I thought okay I'm gonna hike all these amazing trails in the southeast that are closer to home and more affordable and I can split you know a week in the spring and a week in the fall and so right now it's just such a a perfect fit for me to do all these wonderful trails closer to home. And then, yeah, as, as my freedom um, and capacity increases in the future, there's, there's a lot more that I'd like to see and experience. Cool. Very cool. Now I'm going to come back right to where I started in your position as a role model for women. If there's one legacy for your daughter, Charlie, in terms of the outdoors, that you could leave, what do you think that would be? Well, and, you know, let me say, I don't just want to be a role model for women if I'm going to be a role model. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, I, men, I know. But you, men, but you know what I mean. You and, know what I mean, though. And for my daughter and for my son. Um, okay. But, you know, people always always ask like, well, do you want your daughter to through hike? Um, no, yes. I don't care. Like, I, I don't care if she ever through hikes, but man, it would be so amazing if she found something. I mean, the trails I love, like they light me up. I love it. I feel like I'm doing what I was made to do. They've given me this huge sense of, um, you know, empowerment and positive self image. So if my daughter could find that, that would be amazing. And it might be through dance or theater or music or art or, you know, cooking or, or fashion or something totally yeah. different. But if she found that, 
that would make me really excited. And so that's what I want to model for her is like, there are things out there that make you feel so alive and purposeful and beautiful. And if you can find something that makes you feel that way, then grab on and don't let go. Yeah. That's a really good advice for people. And, and you're right. It shouldn't, it's not just for women, but I, I just feel that in, in the, the era of this last five years, more and more women have come to the trail. And I think it is partly because of you. And if that is the case, then that's perhaps where the focus of people's thoughts are on you is as a, as a role model for women. But you're right. It should be for everybody anyway. But look, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. It's been great talking with you. And, um, and I just thoroughly appreciate the, the time you've taken having a chat with me. Yeah, this has been really fun. And thanks for asking some really creative questions. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, well, good to talk to you. And hopefully we'll speak again Monday. All right, thanks, Steve. Cheers then. Bye. She really is such an inspiring woman. And it was nice to know that she's had a doubts on trail as well. None of the people who do these superhuman feats are actually superhumans, you know. They're regular people who just do extraordinary things. And she's right about there being no need to even consider a gender gap. Hiking is for everybody, men and women, and you'll all find friends out there. She also pushed back on me when I wondered if the trail is actually for everybody. She said, and I wrote this down, the trail gives you what you need and the trail will meet you where you're at. If that doesn't make you want to lace up your hiking boots, I do not know what will. I hope that you enjoyed, Jennifer. Now, we're back in Denver, and the first person today is Douglas Ruszewski of Case Knives, part of Zippo. As you'll hear, it was the Zippo that threw me off when I was looking for him. Here's Douglas. <laughs> right, I'm here with Douglas Ruszewski of Case Knives, and um, I'm interested, obviously, Douglas, in the sort of stuff you have yep. that's applicable to hikers. So what, what have you got? Yeah, so uh, just for a little bit of background on Case, I think, first and foremost. So sure. Case um, is uh, based in Bradford, Pennsylvania, so small town uh, Pennsylvania. Sure. Um, they've been based, uh, Zippo, uh, Case has been around for uh, nearly 130 years. Right. Uh, and so 25 years ago, um, Case was actually purchased by uh, Zippo Lighters. Which is uh, why I couldn't find the stand, by the way. Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> so Zippo, the very iconic company. So it was very much a, a kind of perfect mesh of uh, two very iconic uh, made in US brands sure, coming sure. together. Um, so Are uh, they all still made in US? Uh, yes. Okay. So every knife that comes off of... That could have uh, been an nasty question, couldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, every single knife that comes off the Case product line is uh, coming out of the factory in Bradford, Pennsylvania. All right. Um, so, yeah. So uh, that's a really, a, I think, a big point of pride for Absolutely. the brand, for sure, yeah. uh, is that made in U.S. connection. Sure. Um, in terms of, and obviously the heritage of the brand itself, having been around for uh, close to 130 years, sure. uh, really having that longevity in the space, it's something that, uh, you know, they're really proud about. Um, in terms of what's new, uh, we have this uh, brand new knife, it's called the Kickstart Knife. Uh, and so it's the first uh, entry by case into the assisted opener um, catalog. And so uh, it's this Kickstart technology, there's a thumb stud. Uh, so it's very easy to open with one hand, which is incredibly ha um, uh, handy for people uh, who might be, you know, Absolutely, have yeah. their hands busy with other things. Or obviously when you're hiking, uh, you know, you're kind of multitasking a little bit. Uh, so it's got a thumb stud, very easy to open. Uh, it's got a little spring so that uh, it will spring open. Uh, and then there's a liner lock as well, so it will keep it in place right. um, just right, to enable right. uh, some safety as well. Um, yeah, so there's seven different uh, handle variations uh, within that family of kickstart knives. Um, and I think that will be something that um, will definitely continue Isn't that to flip work knife? as well. Uh, yes, exactly. So, so the assisted openers. So the assisted openers have been uh, around for a while. Yeah. Uh, so Case has never created an assisted oh, opener. Oh, interesting. So this, is, so this is the first. Oh, interesting. Into that. Um, yeah. So they're, it's utilizing this uh, what they're calling Kickstart technology, um, and so just a kind of a new product catalog for Case specifically. Right. Um, and then there another uh, kind of new development with Case that's uh, they're really proud about and we're uh, spotlighting here at OR. Um, Case partnered with uh, Southern Grind, which is a knife company also based um, within the United States that was started by Zach Brown, the country music, All right, uh, yeah, country yeah. music artist. Um, and so brand new uh, for this year, uh, specifically uh, within the June-July timeframe, uh, it's this knife called the CG01. Uh, it's got a flipper uh, style technology. So again, just very easy to open with one hand. Uh, so again, just convenience for use is really something that Case is prioritizing. Sure, sure. Um, and it's a little bit more of kind of an everyday carry knife, uh, something a little bit more uh, with a little bit more utility uh, that you can keep in a backpack. Uh, or in your back pocket. And, and now, the, 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 the thing recently on hikers, backpackers, has been ultra light. How, mm -hmm. how, how light do you go? 
Yeah, so that's actually something, especially with the CG01, uh, it's quite light and they want it to be able to, uh, you know, there's uh, pocket clips as well. Uh, sure. So you could just attach it to your belt on either side um, so that it's, it's again, uh, just makes uh, carrying it a little sure. bit more convenient. Um, and something that you can keep in your backpack, it won't necessarily weigh you down, uh, but also something you'll have a ton of utility so around. So how, how do Case recommend you keep a knife sharp? Uh, so, so I will say that's another thing that Case really prides themselves on is uh, having incredibly uh, sharp knives uh, straight out of the uh, out of the packaging. Sure. Um, so when you receive your Case knife, it will be incredibly boned and um, dangerous, <laughs> well, <laughs> super dangerous, uh, but, but very handy for, for, uh, for yeah. use. It's for its purpose. For, yeah, yeah, exactly. right, yeah. Uh, straight out of the box. So that's definitely something that they uh, pride themselves on. Um, and then. You know, they keep it. Uh, they recommend that you keep it uh, sharp very regularly, um, just to make sure that uh, you know your your blade stays honed sure. um, throughout. Um, and they have uh, sharpeners as well that are available for purchase. Um, another thing that I will say, uh, Case actually just relaunched their website, uh, so there's a brand new design. Uh, so it's CaseKnives.com, um, and so really easy. Uh, so the fact that you were bought by Zippo, you don't fall under Zippo in terms of. Your, your products, you fall so under case knives. So you will see some uh, some case knives listed within Zippo.com, uh, but it's really a very much a standalone brand. So caseknives.com, um, again, they relaunched the website specifically for a uh, very easy consumer uh, interface. Sure. Uh, there's actually customization on there as well. It's very easy to search across the entire product catalog, which um, is quite extensive, uh, the case product catalog. So uh, very easy to search amongst different uh, and categories. That's, well, that's and that's where to buy them from, is it? Direct, Correct, yeah. Direct case knives. Are they in stores as well? Uh, they are in stores. There are dealers across the country, uh, so kind of smaller uh, dealers where you can pick up case knives as well. Um, and then some uh, bigger retailers, but definitely caseknives.com I think would be the uh, kind of main uh, landing point if you're looking to uh, take a look through the entire sure. product catalog exactly. or purchase directly exactly. through the website. Okay, cool. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Fantastic. Thank you. Cheers. Made in the USA. Always a good selling point. <laughs> Let me tell you, they are sharp. I normally just have to look at a knife and I'm bleeding, so I was extra careful around these. And how about Zach Brown, combining country music and knives? Excellent. Next up is Matt Fitzgerald of Cauldron. Matt had a very expansive view of what this travel mug could be. Listen to Matt. Right, I'm speaking with Matt Fitzgerald of Cauldron, C-A-U-L-D-R-Y-N. And apparently Matt has got a Swiss Army knife with a travel mug. So how is this a Swiss Army knife and it looks like a travel mug? So we came out to OR a couple of years back. We saw everyone had a water bottle, and we said, so what? What can it do? What can it do other than keep your water cold? But we decided to come up with a product that made it hot. And what we did was we have a 16-ounce vacuum-sealed travel mug that will use a rechargeable battery right. to heat it up to 212 degrees, and it will keep it down, maintain it at room temperature, about 73. So what makes it a Swiss Army knife is a modular design that we have. Yep. And as you can hear, I'm screwing it off right now. <laughs> yeah, it works so well on, uh, on audio, yeah. Takes it out, and uh, we have a Bluetooth uh, connection here that is uh, going to let you manually select the temperature. But it's Bluetooth, oh. so you're able to do it from your smartphone, too. Okay. That comes off. Um, I just took that one off, and now I'm holding the battery. Uh, that's about half a pound. Um, and okay. what that was... Close to a pound. Yeah, yeah. Um, whole thing together is 2.4 with uh, ingredients inside of it. You have here is allowed to maintain temperatures for 12 hours, so you can keep your coffee at your preferred temperature for 12 hours. 173, 196. So you can. You sorry, can you pitch the temperature exactly at what you want? Yep. And you do that through your smart. Oh, oh there's actually a, a digital dial on the front. Yep. Does it convert Fahrenheit and centigrade as well? Oh, it goes uh, Celsius as well. Okay. So you just put it in uh, the app and it comes up as Celsius. All right. So, so what about cold stuff? You can make that cold. I mean, you can. So let's say you're going to your favorite coffee shop and it's piping hot, uh, but you want to turn it down. You can make it cooler and make it to a 176 instead of 198 per se. Right. Uh, but since it's a vacuum sealed uh, travel mug, you what you throw in there will keep a cold beverage cold for about a couple of hours. All oh, right. Okay. But what comes first is keeping things hot. And the best thing is for actually keeping something cold is uh, we have a blender base that you're able to attach. 
battery and the travel mug, and you'll get 20 blends. So that's 20 smoothies, or like I prefer, oh, 20 really? margaritas. All right. <laughs> and the blender is able to crush ice, uh, crush coffee beans, and we'll even have a percolator that lets you make two cups of coffee right in there. Oh, interesting. So, so, so if you took the full package, mm -hmm. how much will that all weigh? Whole package together, uh, that's probably going to be give or take uh, between two and a half to three pounds. Oh, that's not too bad. So, since it's modular, you're going to be going like Lego pieces almost back and forth with it. Sure. Yeah, okay. And so, how much does retail it? So, we're going to have a couple different options. Uh, it's going to be available mid August. Uh -huh. Pre orders are available on our website. Give us the name of the website. And that is cauldron.com. C A U L D R Y N.com. Yeah. Yep. It's available on Amazon, um, available on uh, Cabela's, um, it's available at Bed Bath and Beyond online. Um, oh, wow. Those will be coming up, yep. But for pricing, we have packages the Cauldron Coffee as itself with the battery uh, and the mug itself. That's going to be $129.99. Right. And then we'll have the option that has the blender, and that's going to be $149.99. Okay. And then we'll also be able to have add-ons such as the percolator, which will go for fifteen, um, and the blender by itself will be thirty. Right. So, how how do you charge this? Is it purely through through a plug, or can you do a USB if you've got a solar charger? Uh, we have it plugged right back here into the battery. Okay. So for twelve hours, you're gonna it's gonna twelve hours of output for energy to charge this up. It's gonna be about three hours. From a wall unit? Yep. Okay. All right. Fine. Would a solar charger do it, do you think? There will, the charger will be able, it will come with the package together. All oh, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay, cool. Well, thanks very much indeed for telling us about it. Yep. Thanks Appreciate for stopping it. by. Cheers. So, the Swiss army knife of travel mugs. You cannot say further than that, can you? It was devices like Matt's that made me realise just how much is being done to make people's outdoor experiences that tiny bit better. And as a bit of a gadget freak myself, the thought of warming up my coffee via my phone is overwhelmingly exciting. Last, I ran across a company I'd heard of, Injinji, and I was eager to speak with them about their toe socks. Luckily, Claire Cooperman seemed happy to chat with me about them. She even gave me a pair, and I can report that they are really comfortable. Here's Claire. Okay, I'm here with Claire Cooperman of Injinji Socks, and the reason I stopped by here because I know I tried to reach out to Injinji some time ago and I can't remember what happened. Uh, and I was interested in talking to uh, Injinji about their socks. So tell me what's special about your socks. So all of our socks are toe socks. So it means each toe gets, you know, um, material between each toe. And then it has, you know, comes up the foot. Um, so each toe is wrapped in sweat wicking material. Yep. And the purpose is it eliminates skin on skin friction. So no blisters. Wicks away moisture, keeping your foot drier, and then you get to utilize all of your toes. How do you know how effective that is? Um, we, it's based on the fibers that we use. Right, which is what? We use cool mats. It's a form of polyester. Okay. And just proven to wick away the moisture aspect. I know some people wear two pairs of socks when they hike. Correct. Is, it, is that a thing with you guys? Or? Yep. So actually, one of our mo most popular hiking socks is our liner. It's a very thin, lightweight base layer. Right. And so it protects against the blisters, the skin-on-skin -skin friction. Okay. And then most people, since it's so thin, they want you know a little bit more cushion and comfort. Yeah. So then they'll wear a large, uh, over sock. Um, I noticed you've got different, well, certainly on the picture behind you, which isn't very good in audio, by the way, I, I recognize that. Um, you've got, they look like they're below the ankle socks. You've got different, yes. obviously, heights. We have all different heights. So we have our shortest is our no-show. So it um, doesn't cover the ankle. and has a little heel tab to prevent, prevent chafing. Right. And then we have a mini crew, so that fully covers the ankle. So a lot of uh, trail runners would prefer that because the cuff is a little bit uh, more snug to the ankle. Right. And then we have a crew link mid calf and sure. then over the calf which is our you know knee height size. yeah so how how much do these these socks cost it, they range anywhere from ten dollars and our compression is 49 49 mm -hmm. wow that's a sock isn't it compression <laughs> socks most of our running socks and hiking socks are going to be between ten dollars and twenty and what about the liner how much is that liner's ten Okay, that makes sense. And what le what height is the li does the liner go? It's a crew, so it's mid calf. All right, okay. And where can we get them from? You can get the liner at REI, 
um, and then as well as our online store. Which is in Ginji.com. In Ginji, which is I N J I N J I dot com. Correct. Appreciate it. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And I'll say, she was kind enough to give me a pair, and while they took a few minutes to get used to the sensation, I found them really cosy. No reviews this week, which some of you will doubtless be pleased about, but I can tell you who next week's guests are. It's the Crawfords, that crazy family of eight who took on the Appalachian Trail this year and all made it to the end. Their videos were amazing and captured a spirit that I could only sit back and applaud. I know some people were crappy to them and their parenting, but haters are always going to hate, so who cares what they think? What this family did is a little short of miraculous in my book, so we're going to be having Ben and Cammie, mum and dad, on next week to share their story. Now, because I'm trying to trim back the show, we have the first part of day 12 of the year we seize the day. The second part will be next week. Once more, there is a bleep. Oh, Colin. I'll see you next week. Chapter 13, Day 12, Leaving Belorado Apart Colin, Buddha Sticks in Belorado The next morning, I lie in my bunk in the pre-dawn dark, listening to my fellow pilgrims slump out of bed, haul on socks and boots and backpacks, their muted laughter from the kitchen as they throw down a hurried breakfast, and the click of their walking sticks as one by one they head back to the Camino for the day's 20 or 30 or 40 kilometres. I lie there like a naughty schoolboy playing truant, pretending to be sick when I'm really not. Surely a little bit of pain had never hurt anyone. The frustration of not being able to walk is overwhelming. Today I should be sweaty, squinting with pain and hauling ass to San Juan de Ortega, not sitting around here reading a book. This time last year I spent 10 days in a hospital in Thailand when my ankle got infected. I was bitten by a Russian countess and I know the dangers. Sylvie and the doctors are right, but it's like all the times I played sport. If you get injured, you always want to be out there playing. I was never a good spectator but I'm hoping a couple of days away from the Camino will give me time to regather and regroup. Once, a few years back, I shared a Buddha stick, dope laced with LSD, with three other backpackers. Later, after the gear had worked its magic, I remember stepping over a cow in the street and wondering if it was really there. I had this feeling that everyone in India was watching me, talking about me. I would say things and then wonder if what I had said made sense to anyone else. My life is becoming one big Buddha stick, I am genuinely concerned. Might I be going mad? All my energies are expended now in trying to appear normal. This is not why I came to the Camino, but I admit it is possibly why life drew me here. I won't give up, for Ellie or for myself. It's not blisters or heat or hills that will stop me. But what scares me is that in the process, I will fall apart from the inside out without even noticing that it's happening. Perhaps it already is. Ellie. Comfort in Numbers Leaving Belorado without Colin brings mixed feelings. Initially, I was feeling mighty brave about it, but as I step out of the old berg into a dark, empty street at 5am, I might as well be naked. Venturing tentatively into the unknown with the dim glow of a reading light strapped on my wrist, I take up my own pack along with a lung full of sharp, pre-dawn air. It feels much colder than yesterday. The sky looks blacker, and my pack seems heavier, too. As I trudge down the dark stone street, I find myself wishing Colin back to my side, to slap my pack and lead the way into the night, but he isn't. I am alone out here now, and until Burgos, in two days' time, this is how it will be. I clamber up a rocky hill, beckoning a sunrise, see a solitary figure ahead slip into a thick morning mist and fade to black. At least there is someone to hear me scream. Across the valley, a pale building teeters upon a cliff's edge. It looks like a church, but could be a monastery or a castle. It's hard to make out in the dark. It's about now I'd usually ask Colin to check the guidebook. But remember again that I have left them both in Belorado. He studied that thing like a Bible every hour since we left Roncesvalles, and told me I'd appreciate it someday. I'm almost glad he's not here to gloat. Now there is nothing but arrows to lead me to San Juan de Ortega. Suddenly, I love the arrows. I continue to wonder about Carl. The extent of his injury, condition of his feet, whether the infection has spread, 
whether he'll be okay, whether he'll be there waiting for me in Burgos, or if I'll have to track him down at a city hospital. What if there is more than one hospital? He was like an excited schoolboy when delivering the news that he was staying on in Bilorado. Maybe the break will be the time away from the Camino that he said he needed. Perhaps he was happy for the excuse to stop so he could work things through. Personally, the chance to be alone could not have come at a better time. It's not Colin's company, it's just the Camino. It fills every space, corner, crack and crevice of your mind, constantly inundating you with feelings, thoughts, experiences, emotions, sights, sounds, people and a generous dose of pain to boot. Even the numb nothingness of hours alone can be overwhelming. After a while, you feel like a glass of water full to the brim. You need time alone to sort through the relevant and tip out the mundane before you can take in any more. Already, a kind of filtering process has become. Perspective shifts, focus changes, things that always seemed important just aren't anymore. These days, it all comes back to the same basic elements. Food, water, health and shelter. What I used to refer to as the simple things are now the only things. Nearing the top of the steady climb, the mist thickens, limiting visibility to a few metres. The path disappears. It's eerie up here. The air is still, but ironically it's no longer cold. Through the dark, a large crucifix suddenly appears upon me like an apparition, towering above the summit of the hill. I've reached the peak. It should be down here from here. The path winds through a trio of small towns, each with a smattering of cottages made of moss-covered bluestone. On the far side, the mountain goat trail expands into a broad, bulldozed stretch of red soil. A pack of twelve young pilgrims covers the width of the trail ahead. It's a rare herd compared to the handful of soloists and couples typically encountered throughout the day. I'm not in the mood for talking, so I hang back, keeping them in view. Safety in numbers. The fog lifts to reveal a hazy day. The sun smoulders on a distant horizon, and as the fear slips away, I become aware of other things. First to register is the knee. Until this point, the pain was a dull ache, the kind of throbbing sensation you get following a firm massage. But now it's grown to a stabbing twinge that makes my back arch when it grabs every second or third step. I shake my foot about hokey-pokey style, trying to loosen the joint and prod at the patella, hoping to relieve some pressure, but it swells further when I stop. As with many things today, I realise this is just the way it's going to be. I can focus on it or focus on something else. I begin to rifle through memories, hoping to capture a thought, preferably something very painful, to contemplate that might serve as a distraction. But it doesn't work. Nothing from my past seems to hold as much relevance here as it once did. It's a revelation that I hope is permanent. I'm told I think too much. I overanalyse everything. Find it hard or near impossible to let things go. These days, pondering anything I can no longer change feels like wasted energy. I've become far more pragmatic in thought. My only concern is with what lies ahead. My knee, Colin and getting to San Diego. Finally, it gets too much and I snap. I don't like it, but I have no other choice. Scouring the side of the path, I look for a stick. Yes, a pilgrim stick. I've caved. Colin's going to laugh. But if I'm going to do this, my stick must have character. Also, I'm over six foot tall, so it has to be at least five feet long and strong enough to hold my body weight to ease the pressure on the knee. Testing a few possibles along the way, I finally find a branch poking through the mud on the side of the trail. It's a long and narrow staff with a slight twist in the middle and a kink at the bottom end. It doesn't look very impressive on the outside, but beneath the dirty bark, the wood is bound to be beautiful and new. The twist reminds me of the scoliosis in my spine and the kink near the bottom is in exact proportion to where an unhealed stress fracture from past sporting days still lies in my lower back. Twiggy, but strong. I decide it is the perfect companion to accompany me on my journey. Unfortunately, when I attempt to remove the branch from the mud, I find it is in fact a root attached to a freshly bulldozed tree. Unperturbed, I drop to my knees and begin digging the sucker out. I've made up my mind. This is my staff, my new buddy, the trusty second-in-command that's going to see me through Santiago. Determined, I yank and heave until, finally, I fall to my backside in the dirt and the stick is mine. 
Inspired by my new toy, I overtake the group in front, proudly whittling the rod with the blade of my pocket knife as I pass. There are several sly Spanish remarks, and no doubt there will be more to come. God only knows what Cole will say when he finds out I got a root out on the way to Burgos. But planting the stick on the ground, I realise Olga, the German woman, was right. It does help ease the pressure, and with newfound optimism, I push on. Entering an open field of pasture scattered with plots of high-stemmed maize, I look ahead along the trail and count 18 fellow turtles lugging homes on their backs. The numbers in the Camino are growing every day. I want to be alone, but it appears there's little hope of that today. I play a solitary game of cat and mouse to pass time. Pick a pilgrim, catch a pilgrim, pass a pilgrim. The trail leads on to a busy highway. The way marks cross the asphalt onto a narrow bike lane on the opposite side of the road. It's a wonder no one has been hit and killed by a passing car. At the base of a nearby tree, there are a bunch of flowers with a scallop shell bound around them. Someone has been. I pass a roadhouse at the edge of the next town. The majority of the crowd have gathered in Villafranca Montes de Oca for an early lunch. Savouring an opportunity to escape, I fill my empty bottle at a nearby fountain and prepare to get ahead of them. Gathered on the stone wall is another small group eating. Something doesn't add up. I ask three pilgrims why so many people have stopped. The two French girls look stunned and point to the boy in the middle. The young boy removes his map from his back pocket and in perfect English tells me that there are no more towns until San Juan. How far is that? Fifteen kilometres, he says, uphill. Looking at the terrain index on the map, I see that the mountain before me is a monster. A knife's edge that peaks and then drops on the far side. Straight up and over through the Montes de Oca forest to San Juan de Ortiga, this is it. My first solo challenge. I call into a tienda to buy food for the road, approach the sheer face of the mountain base, look down at my gammy knee, think happy thoughts, take a deep breath and begin. It's just after 10.30am. I have 15 kilometres ahead. That's 10 kilometres at 4.5 kilometres per hour equals 2.2 hours. And 5 kilometres at 3.5 kilometres per hour equals 1.43 hours. 2.2 hours plus 1.43 hours plus 1 hour for accumulated rest stops along the way equals 4.65 hours. A total of 279 minutes. Therefore, I should arrive at the next town by around 3.09pm, give or take. My high school maths average was C-, so by the time I figure that out, I'm already through the worst of it. 